Eric Bischoff is on the line. Eric, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm, I'm decompressing after the last couple of days, but uh, but doing very well. Uh, I can imagine. Now, one of the things, yesterday was a pretty busy day between all the, the press conferences and all the interviews. I can just imagine, uh, considering, considering all, all the press that, that came out of this thing, um, did you have any chance as far as to talk to the booking committee and, and will you, how soon before we see, shall we say, new fingerprints on the television product? Uh, you know, it's going to take some time and, you know, I addressed this a little bit yesterday, but, you know, these guys, and I'm talking about, you know, Ed and, and Terry and, and, and everybody involved, you know, in the, in the creative process currently at WCW have been working you know, more or less in a vacuum without a lot of direction and not able to make a lot of decisions, not really able to make a lot of um, changes in terms of the roster and, and taking advantage of people that are available and that kind of thing. But, you know, they, they, they've done their very best to to lay out, you know, a plan, and it would be really unfair and, and probably not wise for me to come in and try to immediately change everything and undo everything that they've done you know, over the last couple of months. So, you know, my goal is to, to come in. You know, I'm going to help when I can. I'm going to throw out a few suggestions here or there, you know, when I can. But I think over the next two months or so, month and a half, two months, I'm going to gradually kind of change the direction of the company and, and not radically change anything that's going on right now. But if you see, like, a finish on Sunday that you think might not be in the best interest of the company, you'll just have them change it? Um I mean, I can't imagine, and I talked to them a little bit, you know, to answer your first question, I did spend a little bit of time with everybody uh, yesterday after the initial meeting with, you know, department heads and VPs at, at WCW when we made that announcement, and we went through a question and answer period with them, uh, a brief one, and then we went and, you know, did all the press. After we did the press, then, you know, I went into to meet with the, the booking committee and, you know, kind of heard what they had in mind, heard what they planned on doing at, at the pay-per-view. And quite frankly, I didn't really hear anything that, you know, made my, my head spin or my eyes roll back in my head. Um, you know, they've, they've worked really hard, and they're, they're doing some pretty good things. It doesn't, it may not feel like it, but I, I think there's been a lot more uh, consistency and, you know, cohesiveness in terms of the storylines and, and direction over the last month or two than there has been in the last six months. And, uh, you know, they're going to do fine. I'm, I'm, if I see something I don't like, you know, I'm going to bring it up. I'm, you know, I'm not the kind of person that can just sit back and, you know, bite my tongue and not say anything. Uh, I'll bring it up. And if I come up with a good idea between now and Sunday that I think will improve the show, I'll, you know, exert some influence there. But, you know, I'll do it in a, in a kind of cooperative, supportive way. What What do you think, and, and have you gotten assurances from, from TBS or TNT, actually, as regarding, like, the real frequent preemptions? I mean, there's, like, four and seven weeks you know, in, in this run. Yeah. And I, I think that's just been a total momentum killer. So it has really been a momentum. It, 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 it really has, and it's a good point, you know, on your part. Because really, you know, if you, if you, you know, take off your critics' hat, and I don't mean you in particular, but all of us, you know, as people who watch, if we take off our critics' hats and, you know, and that, and that reacts so much to the ratings, but if you really look at it, one of the things that I think has hurt WCW, and it happens every year at this time, quite frankly, but one of the things that has hurt WCW is, you know, those preemptions. People get out of a viewing, you know, out of their viewing pattern. They kind of, you know, if you're getting a little bit of interest in the story and people are starting to follow it week to week, and then all of a sudden it disappears for a week or two weeks, you know, if you did have them or you were starting to get to them a little bit with a good story, you know, you lose them just as quickly. And, you know, I, I don't think the last last week's ratings really is reflective of, of the interest that they've been able to build, you know, over the last month or two in their stories. So in terms of have we gotten assurances, you know, I don't know that that was really part of the negotiation. TNT, just like, you know, TNN or USA did, you know, they're going to have, you know, the right to, you know, take advantage of programming opportunities that they feel are important to them. And if that involves us getting preempted from time to time, I'm sure we're going to be. But... I, you know, I think TNT and TBS both recognize that, you know, this is a valuable, valuable, you know, property for them. And, and quite obviously that was a big part of the negotiation, and that's why we have the long-term relationship that, that we have. And they also recognize that it's not in anybody's best interest to consistently preempt the show. But the 22nd is still preempted? Uh, you know, I don't even have, I don't have the schedule. To be honest with you, I haven't looked it's, at it. It's, it's, it's going to air on the 23rd, the show on the 22nd. Yeah. I think they're doing, uh, was it 2001 on the 22nd? Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I don't, I don't have that schedule in front of me. Now, now, in the role that you're going to be in, you are pretty much more. Are you? Would you say that you're going to be more autonomous as far as like the ability to make deals than you were 
than you were when you were working for TBS? Because I know that you and I have talked in the past that so there were there were a lot of deals and a lot of a lot of wrestling in the future. It, it, as much as we talk, we always talk about booking and pay, if the pay per view is good or bad. In the big picture, this business is dominated by you know making the right deals. Uh, well, it, it right is, time. and I don't you know it's not so much about me having individual autonomy and being able to run off and go make deals that I you know alone think are good deals. It's about you know the company and, and, and the people involved in the company being able to make those decisions and not having not having individuals who are really not involved in the company and really don't understand the business or recognize what those opportunities really mean to a company like WCW, having the ability to either slow down the process or in some cases, you know, you know, make a decision that has a negative impact on WCW, quite honestly because they, they just really don't understand it in, in WCW's world or context. So I think, you know, without question, you know, those of us at WCW, whether it be in marketing or promotion or 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 creative, or, or production, or whatever area, the business units you know, are certainly going to be able to make decisions much more quickly, and, and, and from an entrepreneurial approach, as opposed to you know a very kind of pragmatic corporate approach. Um, and I, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm afraid that you know I'm going to say things that are going to be you know reflected, or uh, I'm, I'm going to make a, a statement that reflects poorly on Turner or Time Warner, and I certainly don't mean to do that. It's just a different culture. And certainly, we're going to be in an entirely different environment and an entirely different culture now. Are you uh, planning on being a television performer, or are you going to be behind the scenes completely? Because the first thing you know, my, my preference is, you know, and I know, you know, this, you know, has been asked before, and it doesn't really matter what I say because no one's going to believe me when I say it anyway. But um, I, I don't really enjoy. Um, and parts of me enjoy it. I mean, it is a rush to be able to go out there in front of people and, and, you know, when you get the kind of reaction that, you know, we used to get or I used to get and they're throwing stuff at you and they're screaming and, you know, that, that was my job is, is to make people hate me and, and, and I was good at it and naturally. But, and that's a rush. It, it, you know, I, I guess it's probably why, you know, rock stars refuse to retire and, and actors just, you know, love to play Broadway because you, you have that direct connection with the audience that you and it's a sensation that you really can't get any other way and and I like that but that's not really what I do best and there was a time when you know when we launched the NWO and, and we established the wrestlers versus the company and, and all of that it made sense you know that was a, a, a logical role for me in, in some regards although some people will disagree with that but it made sense because I was you know the head of the company um, but I'm so tired of that storyline. I'm so tired of wrestlers versus, you know, the company that if, if that's not the, the premise, then there's really not a role for someone like Eric Bischoff because I'm not a wrestler. I'm never going to be a wrestler. I'm, I'm too old. I'm too fat. And I'm really not interested in trying to, to learn that craft at this stage of my life. So uh, there probably won't be a role for me, but it's because there probably isn't going to be the company versus the wrestler premise. Do you think you might have spread yourself too thin back in the uh, late 90s when you were trying to do that and creative? And just well, like... yeah. I mean, there's no question that I spread myself too thin, but I don't think it was because of, of my time on camera. And quite, quite, you know, I mean, I lived it, and I know it, and I know it, how it affected me. And to be very honest, that was probably, more than anything, being able to forget everything else that I was doing and and go out and perform you know, for two minutes or six minutes or ten minutes on a Monday night was a relief for me. It was, it was, you know, like having taking the pressure valve in the back of my head and you know releasing all that pressure and going out and actually having fun with with what we do. But in terms of being spread too thin, I was spread too thin because, quite honestly, and you know, again, not I don't want to criticize anybody at this point, and I you know I don't want to cast aspersions, but I was a one. Uh, I, I was I was a one horse race back then, you know. I did just about everything that needed to be done, and I was involved, you know, in in many ways much more deeply in areas that I should not have been involved with, and, and it was unfortunate that I had to be involved with them. But somebody had to do the work, and you know, one of the mistakes you know that a lot of people make, and, and I was certainly one of them, is not surrounding yourself with people that are really really good at what they do so that you don't have to be involved in every aspect of the business because, you know, you just can't. There's, you just can't. And that's how I spread myself too thin 
not necessarily as a result of being a performer. Okay, we're here with Eric Bischoff, the uh, new president of WCW, former president of WCW, as a matter of fact. Uh, when we go back, you know, this business has cha changed so quickly. And you go back two years from now, uh, January 4th, 1999, a little over two years and one week from today, actually. Um, it's just amazing when you think about, you know, WCW at that point, while WWF was ahead in the ratings a little bit, uh, I think you did like a, you were doing in the mid fours in the ratings. You did a Georgia Dome show that did just under a million dollars, like $930,000. And right, that was the period where it started going down. I mean, when you look in hindsight, uh, the big buildup and then the big fall, um, what could have been avoided? And another question I have is, like, with all the reports of the losses this year, like $60 million, even more, how does that happen? I mean, like, I, I guess, is, 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 it, is it just that the revenue decreased that much? Was it, you know, the, I mean, I mean when, I, when I look at, like, the one, the, the year before, I mean, there were losses. Those were believable losses. When I started hearing, like, the middle of last year, and they were starting, the, that number of $80 million and $70 million started showing up, it was like, how does this even happen? Well, you, you covered a lot of ground on that question, so let, let me let me rewind it a little bit. You know, first of all, to go back to you know January of '99, and you're right. I mean, we put 35 or 40 thousand people, or whatever the number was. Maybe it was 25. I don't remember the, the number of people, but you know, it, it was close to a million dollars in revenue. Pay-per-views were still doing, you know, substantial numbers. You know, a bad pay-per-view was a point seven or a point eight. Um, which are still generating a tremendous amount of revenues, and pay-per-views are just generally so profitable to begin with. You know, the cost of putting on a pay-per-view, you know, compared to the amount of you know revenue you generate with them, is it makes it you know one of the most profitable you know business units you know in the entire business of wrestling. But you know what happened? You know, I think if you look back at what we did, we built a monster. You know, we we took WCW from you know, $24 million a year to, you know, in excess of $200 million a year within 48 months. And we built up a, a pretty substantial in, infrastructure in the process, and most of that, quite frankly, was in talent, which everybody knows. That was the method that we used to build the business. And, you know, again, it's, it's easy to criticize it in retrospect and talk about what people would have done differently now that they know, you know, how the business has changed. But I doubt anybody really knew, you know, what was going to happen, you know, two, three, four, five years in advance, you know, back in that at that time. But yeah, we we built it up. We we got the talent. And, you know, it was a bidding war between both companies, and both companies ended up having to change the way they compensated talent. You know, Vince McMahon was never given, you know, never gave guarantees before, whether they were called downside guarantees or otherwise. Generally, never did that, and he was forced to do it. We were forced to to compete with him. His business model. You know, created opportunities that, quite frankly, you know, the business that I inherited when I when I took over WCW, it didn't provide those opportunities. When I took over WCW, when I went to work for WCW, for that matter, in 1991, there was no opportunity for an announcer or a character, for that matter, or a wrestler of any kind, to share in the upside of a pay-per-view or to profit share in licensing or to profit share in merchandising. The only way that WCW could really compensate for the way their business was structured was to offer salary guarantees because any talent is going to going to come in and say, well, okay, you know, I want to work for your company, but what's in it for me? How am I going to benefit? And if you can't show them, you know, a, a model that says, well, you're going to generate revenue um, in, in a way that uh, is a little bit different because you're going to share in the pay-per-view revenue. You're going to share in licensing. You're going to share in merchandising. You're going to share in house show revenue. Then you have to be able to say to them, well, since we're not going to offer you that, we're going to offer you a flat guarantee. That's what what Turner did and WCW did when they bought the business and established the business, you know, in 1990 and 91. Now, to to a certain extent, you know, it was my job to build the business, and I did it by attracting talent, and I attracted talent by by you know offering them a better compensation package, which really isn't any different than you know the movie business or or, or any other area of sports. And it worked. You know, we, we took WCW to profitability for the first time in their history. And we not only took it to profitability to the first time in their history, but without the benefit of having, you know, statistics in front of me, we probably increased revenues over a thousand percent within a 48 month period of time. That's substantial. And, and, and that, it was huge. But 
when, you know, in retrospect, when you look back, and when WCW was on top, and when WCW was winning, and when they were taking the water coolers out of, you know, Titan Towers, and I don't mean this, you know, actually, but, you know, yeah, we figuratively, when, when, when Vince was laying people off, and it looked like financially their backs were up against the wall, and, you know, they were, you know, they were making drastic cutbacks in every area of their business, and, you know, it was financial doom and gloom, you know, he said, okay, wait a minute, I've got to compete. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to abandon family entertainment. I'm going to go with a Howard Springer, Jerry Stern, or Jerry Springer, Howard Stern approach to to wrestling. I'm going to attract that male 18 to 39 year old audience instead of you know the children that I've been marketing to for so long. And when he did that, the audience that we kind of owned at that point, which which we did. I mean, we were we were outperforming the WWF in every measurable category in every demographic. We owned that 18 to 39 year old demo. But when we, when he changed his format and he changed the content of his show, a huge chunk of our audience, and it didn't happen instantly, but it happened over a, a 10 month period or 12 month period. But a, the, the most important chunk of our audience in, ter, in terms of ad sales revenue and pay per view uh, revenue began to drift, drift away from WCW because quite frankly, we weren't giving them what the, uh, what, what the competition was giving them. The competition was giving them, you know, over the top, controversial, in your face, sex, violence, breast, you know, middle fingers, chugging beer. I mean, hey, you know, when I was between eighteen to thirty nine year old, I would have left too. Because it was it was much more you know it was much more rock and roll than what we were offering. We were trying to produce a show that was safe for children and was you know, was a safe show for parents to watch with their five and seven year old children. And we did. Unfortunately, that wasn't where the audience was, and that's what you know. So, yeah, we 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 built up this monster. We built up a talent roster in order to be competitive. We made long long term commitments in order to be in the business, and it worked until the game changed. And when the game changed, and that huge chunk of audience just shifted, we were left with the long term long term commitments we made to get to the dance, but could no longer compete in a way that. That allowed us to sustain, you know, the machine and, and keep feeding the machine. So that's where the losses came, and it, the losses, quite frankly, are, are indeed losses in revenue. They're not. It's not that the expenses kept going up. I was, I my talent, you know, the talent um, budget when I left in 1999 was not much higher than it was in '97 and '98 when we were kicking everybody's rear end. And, and we're making you know money hand over fist, and they were giving me Rolex watches you know, with my bonus checks. You know, the, the talent budget hadn't increased. What changed is the drop off in pay per view revenue, the drop off in licensing, the drop off in merchandising, the drop off in ticket sales. That's where you see those monster losses coming from, not on the expense side, but on the revenue side. So have you thought about maybe restructuring the contracts when uh, you know everyone's ninety days rolls over the current contracts come up and do some sort of like a uh, downside guarantee that WWF does. So when things are good, guys make more. When things are bad, they make less. Well, you know, we've talked a lot about that, and a lot of that is probably going to happen, you know, although, you know, I don't know the details yet. And, you know, we, we haven't, you know, framed a, a, a contract model that's, you know, that I could address in any specific terms. But obviously, something needs to change. And, I mean, a lot of things need to change. And, Certainly, because of the nature of our business and because of the responsibilities that talent has, it's almost it almost requires and mandates that there is an incentive-based agreement. Because, quite frankly, it's not just about showing up at, at, at TV, doing what you're asked to do, and going home. It's about you know performing to the best of your ability on television. It's about making personal appearances. It, it's about you know, making the house shows and being enthusiastic and working hard when you get there, not just showing up because, you know, the guy sitting there checking you in is going to report you for being late. If you don't show up, you're in breach of contract. It, it requires a whole different relation. The talent has to have a whole different relationship to the, to the business of our business than they do when it's just a guaranteed, you know, contract. So for all of the right reasons, both from, you know, financial protection, if you will, so that when things are good, everybody benefits, and when things are bad, you know, we don't get killed, but also from, you know, just the psychology of, of what the business responsibility is, you know, with the talent and, and what their responsibility is to the business, um, it, that dynamic changes as well. 
Is there, I mean, we, a lot has been talked about as far as the, the age of a lot of the top guys when, when, when the company started going down, and they're, now, they're two, now they're two years older. Um, you know, you, there's this, what, do, I mean, do you have a framework on what you're going to do? Because clearly, to make it, you're going to have to make some new stars, whether they're someone that's working for another company. Uh, you're not going to be grabbing Vince McMahon stars, as we've talked about, um, whether it be, I mean, there's a lot of guys, I mean, and, and, and listeners of the show have been sending me names. I mean, there's a lot of guys that you could bring in as underneath and mid-card guys and then be in nice programs and they're good workers. But, you know, there's only a few people in this world that turn into The Rock and Steve Austin and, and, and people like that. And, and, and Bill they, Goldberg. Bill Goldberg, <laughs> Bill, Bill, Bill Goldberg was there for a while. They're, they're harder to create and... Um, and when you get when, when and when you and when they start get when they start getting going, I mean you've got to light the rocket on them too, you know, or else they'll stagnate. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I obviously I agree with you. There's no there's no disagreement, but my perspective may be slightly different. I'm not sure. You know, when, when you you know when you say Steve Austin, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is you know Steve Austin, although he's you know chronologically, you know, he's certainly not an old guy, but Steve has been around. This business for I'm, I'm guessing you know I haven't read the biography on him or anything but I, I think he must have been around for what 10 12 years 10 11 years yeah you know and that means he's been in the business for at least eight years before he really made it big um, the rock is a phenomenon and you know the rock and Bill Goldberg although you know, certainly the rock has has you know maintained his popularity you know more so but you know there's only two guys that I can think of in recent history in either company, that have made it to the main event and stayed there. I don't mean just danced the dance once or twice or worked into a main event for, you know, a three-month period and then disappeared into the main card, you know, uh, to a main card or middle-of-the-card status again. But there's only two guys, Bill Goldberg and The Rock, who, who have been in the business for less than ten years who have made that mark. And the reason Bill Goldberg did it, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the biggest reasons Bill Goldberg did it is because of his his natural charisma, his look, his ability in the ring, but almost as importantly because of the timing. When Bill, Bill Goldberg came in, you know, WCW was hot. I mean, almost everything we did was perceived to be hot. And he was a guy who stepped in in a big way at the right time and made a huge impression. Fortunately for The Rock, he did the same thing. When The Rock really, you know, came into uh, his own in the WWF, it was when the WWF was really at its peak, and it made a guy like The Rock, who has, you know, more natural charisma than any human being I've ever, you know, seen. I mean, the guy drips charisma and, and style, and you know, you, you bring someone like that in when you're hot, and it just makes it that much easier. But you take those two guys out of the equation, Bill Goldberg and The Rock, and what you're essentially left with are, are workers, wrestlers, who learn their craft to develop their skill and develop a relationship with an audience, you know, in a, in a six or seven or eight or ten year period of time. And well, WWF of late, and, and, and it's really phenomenal, but they've taken guys, Kurt Angle, Asian Christian, I mean, really over a two year, three year period. And Angle even less. Angle really in, in one year. Sure. I mean, it's, yeah, I've never. I mean, in, in, historically in wrestling, you know, it usually was taking, you know, people years and years, except for the occasional, you know, freak, you know, that just had it and, and, and made it quick like The Rock. But WWF is really, in the last, I mean, they, they've really, it's amazing what they've done in the last two years with, with young guys that were nobodies in this business, eight, you know, 18, 24 months ago, that are now doing, t doing television commercials and, um, you know, even if they're, you know, and, 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 and you know, they're, Basically, you know, I mean, Kurt Angle's going to be a superstar as long as he physically can hold up, I think. And Agent Christian, I think they've got a 15, you know, they may have 15 more years. I agree. And they have done a phenomenal job, and it's turned into a talent factory. But, you know, my point was going to be when, you, when you're when you hot and you've got guys that, that are over, the formula is to, number one, be smart enough to identify the people who have the potential and then move them into the dance with the guys who are already over so there's that rub, so to speak, you know, with your top talent, and you move them up in a logical, you know, methodical kind of a way. You know, do, do I recognize that needs to be, you know, the formula? Absolutely, I do. Do we have a plan to do that? I think we do. You know, I, I think I've got a pretty good idea how to do that. Um, but, you know, the first, the, first order, the first order of business is to get hot, 
The second yeah. order of business, and it happens almost simultaneously, is to go out and start recruiting people that you think have that X factor. And, you know, we've got, you know, some ideas that are, you know, and I know, you know, when I tell you that I'm not going to talk about them, it's not that I don't have an idea, but some of it's fairly pr proprietary. It's, it's different. It's a little unique approach, and, you know, sharing it isn't exactly in our best interest right now. But, you know, it certainly is going to be a priority because I agree with you. Without new talent, fresh faces that are compelling and exciting and at least have the potential to move into that, you know, main event spot, you're forced to tell stories with the same, you know, the same, you know, roster that you've been telling stories with for too many years, and it, it doesn't work. Well, there's something in the variety today. Some speculation about sitting down with WWF trying to put together a joint pay per view. I mean, do you really think that that's that's feasible? I mean, and I, I couldn't see it now. I mean, maybe in a year, but I mean, but do, do you think it's feasible that that they would work with a group that has been their opposition since the beginning of time, basically? No, I, and I don't know where that came from. I, I, I haven't read that article. It certainly didn't come from me. Um, I, I think you know. It was either taken out of, I would guess, it was either taken out of context or somebody was reading between lines. Um, I, I don't see that as as reality. And, you know, I know people think, we've all heard, you know, people talk about, you know, what a monster paper review would be and, you know, all the different kinds of opportunities it would present. And in some, you know, in, in one sense I understand it and I agree with it, but there's a reality as well. And the reality is, you know, Coke and Pepsi are never going to joint market Coke and Pepsi. You know, Ford and General Motors are never going to work together and try to design a new car and and, and come out with a with a joint venture you know product in the in in the marketplace. So, you know, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to some people for a lot of reasons, and it's fun to think about. But you know, the reality is, it's you know, it's just not going to happen. And I, you know, I don't, like I said, I don't I don't know where that where that story came from. You had a lot of success with the NWO angle, which was pretty much. I guess somewhat of an interpromotional angle. And you made a comment last night on WCW Live about how there was probably a better, smarter way to do that angle. And one of the things we'd always thought was the whole NWO angle was set up over a course of many years. And when all was said and done, WCW never got its big win over the NWO. And it just kind of sort of fizzled out from there. And do you think that hurt the company that WCW never got the big win and was kind of portrayed as the loser in the end? Or do you think that uh, there was that wasn't the case? No, I, I think in a sense you're right, but but and I think I agree with what you say, but I may agree with it for slightly different reasons than perhaps you know you have. You know, I, when I said I think there was a better, smarter way to do it, what I meant was, and I'll, and I'll give you very specific examples of, of what I mean. You know, when when you have a brand like WCW, and then you have popular characters, and when I say popular, I don't mean, you know, the fact that the people, you know, like them or dislike them, but I mean if, that they feel strongly one way or the other. When you have a Scott Steiner or a Kevin Nash or a Scott Hall at the time, um, you know, or a, or a Hollywood Hogan at the time, come out, or, or an Eric Bischoff, because I was guilty of it too, um, come out and, and even though it's creative and even though, you know, we know what we're doing, we know why we're doing it, and it's a, you know, it's a cooperative effort, but when you come out and you say things that don't support the brand, and, you know, for example, when, a, when, when Scott Steiner, and I'm not picking on Scott because he was doing it in probably my direction, would come out and say, WCW sucks. Well, even though it was part of, if you want to call it a storyline, a storyline, you know, it just, it, it's probably not the smartest thing to do, <laughs> which is yeah. an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> It, it, there's a better way to do it. There's got to be a smarter way to tell the same story and to position people, you know, in, in their points of view the same way, but to do it without necessarily degrading, you know, the brand that, you know, is so important. And that, that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. yeah, now, I think whether WCW finally got the big win or, or didn't get the big win, I think that would be, you know, that, that's, that's mandated more by, you know, storyline and timing and, you know, who's a part of WCW and who's not. But, or who was a part of WCW and who wasn't at the time. But I, I think the process of building the story and, and how you treat the brand is is where we probably made some mistakes and could have been smarter. Yeah, because, I mean, I think if, if like, uh, you know, if Rock were running down Steve Austin and he constantly said that he sucked and he just kept beating Austin on every show, 
then Austin would suck. In yeah, the exactly. Hands. But if in the end Austin got his big win and won the title or whatever, in a way it would kind of show that, you know, the heel rock. Well, the heel was wrong. Thought, and he doesn't he suck. No, I, you know, I agree with you. I, I, I agree. I think we're probably saying the same thing from probably slightly different angles, but, but, I, but I agree with you. What about working with uh, other companies? Um, and and uh, we've gotten really a, a flood of emails regarding the uh, idea of Paul Heyman as a booker, because clearly his company is in a lot of trouble right now. It may not even be around very much longer. Um, he's, they, they, have, they have some good talent that's been exposed to only a niche audience. Um, I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on working with him, bringing, bringing him into the thing, um, you know, something like that, and also working with New Japan, which you had a relationship with for years and years, the, the relationship that's fallen apart, and also with Ultimo Dragon because they've got some, you know, some of the most awesome young workers that no one's ever seen, although they are, they are all Japanese. Well, um, again, Dave, you cover more ground with one question than anybody I've ever talked to. Uh, you know, first of all, with you know, with ECW and Paul, um, you know, I, I, I don't remember who said it. I think it was. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, someone once said, you know, the reports of our demise are, are premature. Um, I've been hearing that Paul Heyman, you know, is in financial trouble for as long as I can remember, and that he may not be around for another week or another month for as long as I can remember. So I, I don't know that that's true or not true. In, in terms of working, you know, with 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 ECW, I, I you know, I just don't see it. I mean, I think there's. It's just, I, I just don't see it. Let me just leave, leave it at that. I won't. I won't say you know it'll never happen because I've, I've learned that you know there is no such word as never. <laughs> I'm living proof of that in in the wrestling business. But it, I, I just don't see it as likely or probable, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, yeah, they have a lot of you know, I, and I'm you know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure you know of what their roster is like right now. I'm familiar with some of their their guys and some of their top guys, and I, I do I do believe that they have you know great talents and ability. Whether or not they're interested in coming to WCW, whether or not they're really available, uh, which is always a mystery when it comes to WCW because or ECW because their contracts are like you know the hardest. Yeah, I, I think pretty much everyone's available now though. But, they've all they've all been breached and, and you know Heyman wants to get away from the out of their payroll as far as the you know the top guys. You know I mean you know they you know a lot of them have been paid. Well, I'll, I'll take your word for that, but you know until an attorney would tell me that, I just you know I'll assume that they're really not available, but. You know, if if indeed they are, and if indeed they were, and they were excited about coming to WCW, then yeah, you know, I'd love to talk to them. But I don't think that that should be, you know, the primary strategy here. Certainly, if there's talented people out there and they're working for another company and they want to come to WCW, then obviously I want to talk to them and you know, I want to take advantage of that. But the real opportunity here is going to be our ability to find an innovative, aggressive, efficient way to identify, develop, and expose new talent. That's going to be the make or break, you know, point of, of this initiative. It's not going to be whether we can get a guy from ECW or get a guy from WWF or get a guy from New Japan. Now, let's talk about New Japan. I still have a great relationship. I've, I've maintained my personal relationship with the principals at New Japan, you know, throughout this entire process. The, the relationship fell apart between WCW and New Japan to a certain extent. But my relationship with them, you know, was was maintained, and it still is, and I'm still communicating on a weekly basis, and have been, you know, for since you know last September when I left. Um, I look forward to meeting with the principals at New Japan as early as possible. I, I I would be surprised if we don't do something with them, because I know they want to, and I know I want to, and I know that it can make sense. In terms of Ultimo Dragon, um, you know, I can't wait to talk to him. And I think the fact that you know he's got a lot of great guys that are Japanese is an asset, not a not a liability. I've I've always believed that. I think I've demonstrated that over the years. I think there's a place, and I think there's a way, and and I think there are probably better ways than I've been able to think of in the past to to integrate you know the Japanese style and the, and the culture and the talent into what we do, if not on a regular weekly basis, at least on a regular enough basis that this audience appreciates what they have to offer and it makes the show feel different. And I think that's one of the key ingredients. Now, I know you don't want to be too specific on the uh, whole talent issue, but are you going to be looking primarily for guys that are currently wrestling right now or maybe guys that have just a lot of charisma and the look that can maybe be taught to wrestle or a combination of both? 
No, yeah. I think I think Brian Vidal, my partner, said it best the other day in an interview, and I'm, I'm not even sure he realized, you know, how right he was when he said it. But it's an amazing, it's amazing, you know, whether it's rock and roll or or feature films or television, um, it's amazing sometimes where talent comes from, you know, and, and you know we've all read about you know legendary stories of you know Hollywood, you know, feature film stars being you know discovered and you know. At, at soda fountains and things like that, and yeah. and, and and there are. I mean, if, if if you think about you know the the people that are walking around right now that that have you know a natural charisma and ability, and the camera loves them, and and they can walk into a room and and, and light it up, and and they're entertaining and they're funny and all that, you know, and 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 if you can find a way efficiently to find them, train them, motivate them, you know. Do what you need to do. Promote them. Work them into a storyline. The better you can do that, the more likely you are going to be to be successful. Whether you're a, a record label or a movie studio or a wrestling company. And to, so, to answer your question, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to look outside of the normal course of business. The normal course of business in professional wrestling is you have a training camp, you have a relationship with some regional promotion. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. It's a good thing, and I want to do that too. But it's not enough. You know that's the normal course of business. That's how we operate. And you were and pretty then you, cryptic you, about the and, uh, power plant yesterday. I'm sorry. You were pretty cryptic about the power plant yesterday. Is that something you think is? Well, I didn't. Path? I didn't mean to be cryptic. Um, you know, the power plant at one point was, you know, I don't want to say the cutting edge, but it was kind of a celebrated process. You know, Life Magazine was talking about it, and we were bringing people in and we were training people. But it it was. Uh, I want to say this and make it sound the wrong way, but it was kind of like throwing mud up against the wall and praying some, that something would stick. You bring in a hundred people, and you know whether they were you know bouncers that knew somebody or ex football players or ex you know badasses or ex boxers or kickboxers or whatever it is, you know guys who at one, for, at, at, at one level or another have demonstrated some physical skills, and you bring them in, you teach them how to do you know you teach them how to wrestle, and then you pray that you know one of them has got some charisma. <laughs> That's kind of a screwy process, and I think there's a better way to do that, and that's what we're trying to identify. Are you going to like have? Because uh, one of the things I think that's been lacking in that training is, uh, and, and with a lot of the a lot of the guys, and I think it's, it's hurt a lot of the guys' progress to get to the top, is um, the interview ability. Because it's probably more important now than it's ever been the nature of the business. I mean, are you going to get like acting coaches or something like that? So some guy who's Charismatic, but like stiff as a board when he does an interview, that you can like get something out of him. Or... You know, I, I think coaching. You know, politicians use them, actors use them, athletes use them. You know, sports announcers use them. And I think you know what you're referring to as you know acting coach or dialogue coach or whatever you want to call it. I think is a smart idea, and that's something that you know we have talked about, and, and I think we probably will do. And I think that's one element. You know, I think that's one important piece of business that needs to be addressed. It's something again. That we've never done. WCW's never done that. You know, we, we've what we've done in the past, and the only thing I've ever been exposed to, quite frankly, in the past is you know you find a piece of talent, you know, the guy's got some physical skills, and then you hook him up with someone like an Arne Anderson or you know Vern Gagne used to spend a lot of time you know coaching people on how to do an interview because he felt, and I think you know in his time he was a great interview. Um, but you know, you'd hook them up with another wrestler who was recognized as having, you know, pretty good mic skills, and you try to teach them that way. But you know, that's, that's not enough. There's a better way to do it. And yeah, to answer your question, yeah, that's one of the things that we'd love to do. As far as uh, talent, well, one thing, talent. You know, there's been a lot of uh, problems, both with occasionally talent not wanting to do, not wanting to do jobs, uh, or. There was a deal on a couple of weeks ago where you know Scott Steiner and DDP had their little skirmish, and um, you know I think I think that part of it is, is just the whole atmosphere of being there uh, for the last year has been so depressing for a lot of the guys because you know quite frankly you don't know what's you don't know where you know what's going to happen next. But is is there like like you know there have been instances where guys are out there cutting cutting promos saying things that you know have nothing to do with storyline and probably are things that. You know, it's exactly the opposite of what they probably should have been saying at times, and it just kind of seems like because they have charisma and they're quote top guys, they kind of have carte blanche to almost get away with things, and, yeah. and that lack of discipline I think has really hurt the company because then you have the guys who can't get away with it, 
you start thinking double standard, and, and it just really, you know, it, it really just works against everything. Plus, you know, when you're doing an interview that has nothing to do with the storyline, ultimately, what benefit is it? You know what I mean? No, I, I, you know, I can't agree with you more, and, and it, it, it was painful to watch. You know, it, and managing talent, you know, particularly at WCW, because of the nature of our agreements, I mean, look, you know, I, I probably shouldn't go into this level of detail, but, you know, Vince McMahon has the ultimate hammer. If you piss Vince off, you're no longer in the main event. You're in the opening match. And when that happens, your merchandise drives up, dries up. And when that happens, your share of the house show goes down, and your share of the pay-per-view goes down, and your personal appearances go away. And a lot of other things start happening that are not, that are not good. That's the ultimate hammer, because you can hit them in the pocketbook. And, that, you know, at WCW, that was not the case. And, you know, in, in many cases right now, is not the case. It's hard to hit somebody in the pocketbook with a, with a guaranteed contract. And it's unfortunate that, you know, you have to, you know, be able to try to think that way and, and be able to have that kind of leverage in order to motivate people. But at the same time, you know, I, I will say that part of the reason that that kind of dysfunction was taking place at WCW wasn't just because of the contracts. It was, quite honestly, because of lack of direction and lack of leadership and, and lack of anything that resembled, you know, intelligence and order and, and a common goal. And, you know, when things were hot at WCW, when we were on top and, and, and I was running around thumping my chest and, and, and we were all happy and everybody was thrilled, you know, in many respects, you know, you still had talent that didn't want to do what they were asked to do, that had their own opinions about storylines. You know, I mean, you had, all, you had all the same issues, but generally you were able to manage it because, you know, everybody was winning in a, in a lot of different ways. When you're getting your ass kicked and you're losing and there's no direction, there's no decision-making process, there's no logic, there's no leadership, it's really hard to motivate anybody to do anything. Really, and I, I, you know, I said this, you know, the other day, or maybe it was last night. Success is the greatest motivator in the world. You know, these guys, you know, at the end of the day, take take their contracts aside. At the end of the day, they're competitive. They love to perform. They love to succeed. And sure, they want to benefit financially, like everybody does. But the, the core of it is that they're performers. And I think if we if we become successful again, if we give them a reason to think that this is going to work, if all of a sudden people start showing up again, if merchandise starts selling again, if ratings start inching up again, it's a lot easier to get people to do what you want them to do because they have more confidence in you. So you know, I'm not really worried about that. Yes, it's been a problem. There's no question that it's out of control. I've been sick to my stomach at some of the stupid stuff that I've seen going on in WCW. It's just it, it's it's like watching your kid. You know, dodge cars on a, on a busy freeway. It's just, it's been horrible to watch. But I'm not worried about, you know, my ability to, to improve it. Well, of course, anybody could improve it at this point, but I'm not worried about my ability to get us to a point where that's no longer the biggest issue. I'm, so I'm going to ask you about a couple of names. Um, obviously, the first one that everyone's been asking about, that you're, that you're probably, uh, what about Hulk Hogan? Uh, you know, I, Hulk and I are, are very close friends. We've remained in contact, you know, throughout this entire process. I probably talk to him, if not every day, every other day, you know, for a, a couple minutes here or there, and sometimes longer. Um, you know, we're in. We're 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 going to be negotiating with Hulk. It's it's something that's important to me, and I think there's value there. I think he's, he's an important part of this industry. There's a tremendous, you know, brand value in that Hulk Hogan name, and I think he can be a huge asset for us. That being said, probably not a huge asset in the way that, you know, people assume I think he's going to be a huge asset. And, you know, I need to let it go at that. But we are in negotiations with him. I, I hope, it's my hope, that he is uh, he's going to be a big, big part of what we do in ways that I think are going to surprise people. But, you know, I don't know that that's going to happen for certain, and I think it will, you know, play itself out over the next two, three, four weeks. As far as... Uh... What about some of the guys, uh, your thoughts on uh, some people who've just recently been let go in the company, uh, Scott Hall, Juventud Guerrera, Mark Madden, uh, any thoughts on any of them coming back or not right now? Or uh, You know, Scott, is, is, Scott 
in, in, in my opinion, you know, and I, and I know Scott pretty well, and, I, and I've, I've had to, you know, in, in very uncomfortable ways and ways that I wouldn't choose, have had to deal with Scott on a number of different levels, and not all of it has been, been pleasant at all. Um, but when his head is right, when, when, when he's under control and when his head is screwed up straight, he's really one of the most creative, dynamic, you know, people in this business. And I don't mean just inside of the ring. He's a very, very smart, creative guy that has got, you know, incredible instincts about, you know, the audience and this product. That being said, unless Scott can figure out a way to get his head screwed on straight, I, he's tough to work with. It would be my hope, because, you know, I'm an eternal optimist, unfortunately, in some respects. It would be my hope, you know, that Scott can get himself under control and we could find a way to make it work. But that's really in Scott's control and not in my control. And I, I hope it works out that way, but I, you know, I, I don't know if it will or not. I don't, know, I don't know any other way to answer that. In terms of Hooventude, you know, I don't know. I really wasn't involved in what happened. I, you know, I, the only thing I know about is what I've read, and quite honestly, I'm not sure I, I believe everything I've read. So, you know, I, I'd be willing to talk to Hooventude again. I have my own experience with Hoovy, and not all of it has been good. And I, you know, not, I mean, I like him personally, but you know, I've heard so many excuses and explanations and reasons why you know certain things happen that after a while you kind of get tired of hearing it. And you know, Hooventude's one of those guys that I think has to kind of prove himself um, to whoever he's going to be working for, whether it be me or WWF or somebody else. Um, in terms of Madden, you know, quite frankly, you know, I said this to Mark, you know, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, right after he got, got let go, and he called me. And I said, Mark, this is not a, a personal, you know, condemnation of you or, or anybody else. But quite, quite frankly, too many people who are announcers in WCW feel like they're more important than the show. Like, you know, we spend two hours every night on Nitro uh, for the sole purpose of trying to figure out ways to get announcers over. You know, announcers are a necessary evil, and I and that that and I am one, or I was one. And, and I still and I feel that way strongly because I was one. I know I knew what my role was as an announcer. Our job is to enhance the things that are taking place on on camera or, or in the ring, not for the things in, that are happening in the ring to be happening in order for us to enhance ourselves. And it got all backwards and screwed up. Now I'll say that, and I'll also say that I, I, I'm not sure it was Mark's fault. I don't think there was a whole lot of direction. Or I don't think there was anybody that was explaining that or controlling the announcers at that time. But in terms of do I plan on hiring anybody back? No, there are no immediate plans. But you know, there's some talented people out there that are no longer with the company. And you know, Madden is a talented guy. He's got some potential. There's some great things about Mark Madden. But as and I hate to say it because it's The Rock, but as The Rock says, you got to know your role. And an announcer's role is not to be the star. An announcer's role is to make the stars. I'm going to ask you about Vince Russo. I think it's uh, pretty much universally agreed on that he really hurt WCW very badly. But I think a lot of people would also agree that in the right role, he helped out the WWF. He was a creative guy. Just He had a lot of ideas that had to kind of be weeded out. And do you see any role for Vince Russo in the company, or have you pretty much uh, just decided it's not going to work? Uh... Let me answer that with, with this response. When 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 I was let go in September 1999, sometime in October, I think, you know, Harvey Schiller called me, and he said, because you know, it was actually, you know, Harvey and I had been talking about me coming back anyway in, in kind of a different role, you know, 30 days after I left. So we were still communicating, and Harvey said, "What do you think about Vince Russo?" And I said, "Harvey, it's one of two things." Either Vince Russo sold you guys a bill of goods, and he really wasn't as an important part of WWF's, you know, turnaround as he's he's convinced you he was, or Vince McMahon is a moron for not having him under contract. Because if Vince Russo was as critical and important and creative to the turnaround of the WWF, you know, product and brand, Vin, you know, Vince McMahon is smart enough to have locked him up. So I said, by virtue of the fact that he was available and he wasn't under contract, you know, you, you, you just have to make the decision for yourself. Is Vince, Ru Vince Russo what he says he is? And has he done what he said? Has he actually done what, he's, what he says he's done? Or is Vince, Ru is Vince McMahon a moron? And I think, they are, I, I think we know the answer to that. 
I don't think that Vince Russo was as important in the turnaround process to WWF as many people, including you know, obviously Vince Russo, says he was. I'm sure that he had a lot to do with it, and I'm sure particularly at the time, and again, going back to my earlier comments tonight, when, when you know, Vince McMahon said, okay, screw it, we're going to, you know, damn the torpedoes, we're going to do Howard Springer meets Jerry, or <laughs> Jerry Springer meets Howard Stern meets wrestling, you know, that's that's Vince Russo's forte. But that's a bag of tricks with, you know, I mean, it's a very limited bag of tricks. I don't think that Russo really had the ability to, to, to contribute much beyond, you know, the shock value in, in TNA and how it's, you know, well, how it's turned approach to wrestling. The thing with WWF, when the sponsors started pulling out you now a year ago, and they were forced to tone down, you know, there, you know, there, there are there are points where some, you know, they're, they're, the ratings have actually gone down a little bit now. But all, you know, when when they first toned down, the ratings actually went up. Um, then they, you know, and I think that the ratings decline is just because there's been a little bit of staleness here and there. Yet, you know, their pay per views are still strong. Their house shows are doing very, very well. So, overall, nothing fell when they cleaned up. And when you guys, WCW, started doing really raunchy, you went down. You didn't go up. You know what I mean? He, and, and that, you know, that whole excuse of he wasn't allowed to go as far as he wanted to. That was such you a. Know, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't mean to cut you out, but that was such a that was such a punk excuse. To be honest with you, yeah. I know where you're going well, with this. It look when when Vince Russo came to WCW and said, "This is how I turn the WWF around," and convinced everybody that that was the you know that was the that was lightning in the bottle. All we had to do was do TNA and go over the top and do this you know the stupid crap that they were doing, and that was going to turn the business around. And WCW, in their desperation, said, "Okay, fine, go do it then. Do it for us." The reason it didn't work is because it had already been done. Nobody remembers the second guy that stepped on the moon. You know, the first guy that did that was Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon went out and he did something that had never been done before in terms of that type of content. And when you're the first, you know, when you're first to the marketplace, you're probably going to win with it. But, you know, to try to be a weak copy of that or even a strong copy of that is a failed experiment. It's not going to work. And that's why it didn't work, and that's why our ratings went down. And quite frankly, when you, know, when you talk about the WWF's ratings, you know, going down when they've kind of cleaned up their act, as you say, I've, they've gone up and down. But, they, but they've gone up and down. But I think if, if their ratings have gone down at all, it's because of the, the change of net. I mean, when they went from the USA change, network change of networks hurt, no doubt. To, to TNN, and yeah. you know, I'm not disparaging TNN, but it, it's not the USA network. I mean, they've been there for how many years? So you know, I think their numbers are going to come back up. I think they're going to be fine. And they're not going to have to go to the extremes that they went to in the past in order to get those numbers up. Let's start going to the calls. Let's go to Robin, Oregon. I thank you for your patience. Yeah, hi. I, this is the infamous Robbie Lekovich with the... Uh, oh, my the God. You did an night. awesome job, and I didn't read the whole thing yet, but I've heard so many compliments about you today. Really? That's great. Yeah. Did you get to the cruiserweight stuff yet? I, I did not, but okay. um, like I said, I said uh, you have impressed a lot of people. Uh, he, he wrote a... A lot of stuff about WCW that's up on the uh, WrestlingObserver.com website, and got a lot of compliments about it uh, uh, before before the show started. I didn't get a chance to read the whole thing. I read, I started reading it though. But anyway, go ahead. Okay, I have three very uh, particular questions I'd like to ask Mr. Bischoff. The first question is about how, undeniably, over the past year plus, that WCW has alienated their core audience of pure wrestling fans, and if you consider them a viable part of your audience, and if you have any strategies planned to bring them back. Yes, I do. You know, consider wrestling fans to be a viable part of the audience. It still says wrestling on the marquee. I mean, wrestling is a you know wrestling is a category that attracts an audience for a certain reason. It's, it's dynamic to watch. It's physical. It's good versus evil. It, you know, it, it embodies, in my mind, you know, the best of you know boxing and, and and football and soap opera. But you know, you have to have the wrestling element. You have to have the physical element. It can't be about wrestlers trying to be comedians or wrestlers trying to be, you know, sitcom stars or wrestlers trying to become, you know, actors. It, it's about wrestlers being good wrestlers. And, yes, you have to have, you know, certain skills that might fall into, you know, an actor's category, but you've got to wrestle. You, you can't be a wrestling show and attract a wrestling audience without wrestling. Um, and, and in terms of strategies, you know, it's no secret. I love the cruiserweight division. I, I thought it was one of the things that made Nitro 
different back in 95 and 96 and 97. I think it gave us an edge. I think it made us it made us more fun to watch because it was more visually dynamic. And, you know, that's one of the strategies, although it's not an original one, but it's certainly one of the strategies that, that I want to go back to because I know that it will work. And specifically relating to that question, I was wondering if you've heard of a guy named Chris Daniels, who I believe could be a tremendous asset to uh, achieving that goal and bringing back the wrestling fans who would, I think would tune in specifically to see him. Uh, heard honestly, him? I've heard the name um, a number of different times, but I can't say that I'm familiar with him and I... You know, I'd love to. You know, I'd love to, to see his work because because right now, I mean, there's some good cruiserweights in WCW right now, and I know that there's a lot. You know, and the other you know the other great thing about cruiserweights is there's just more of them. You know, there's just more guys out there. There's a there's a bigger pool of talent to choose from. You know, you know the average American isn't 275 pounds and ripped up, and you know there's just a much bigger pool, and that means you know there's, it's more likely that you're going to find guys who are capable of doing really dynamic, physical, you know, fun things to watch, but also have a lot of charisma. So, you know, for all the right reasons, you know, not only do I want to see what you know Chris Daniels has offered, but I, you know, I, you know, we're going to be going after that cruiserweight division in a big way. Okay, for my second question, I'm going to try to phrase this as politely as possible because I don't want to annoy you in any way, but you have an obvious predilection for brand names and established older stars. And I'd like to know if you really think that's what the wrestling fan of today and the generation coming up of wrestling fans really want to see. Um, by the way, good job. Not pissing me off, but <laughs> <laughs> very well worded. <laughs> but you, you, you try to understand that you know, yeah, I, I you know I favor brand names and I and I value them. But I value them for the right reason. It's not that I think solely, you know, a, a, a business is going to going to survive, survive and prosper, you know, solely in our ability to attract and maintain the same big names. But you have to have those, you know, going back to some of my comments earlier. You have to have names that people recognize and feel strongly about, in order to benefit people that you're bringing up. You know, I think one of the things in, in, in a very drastic way that WCW has, has done, you know, incorrectly over the last six months or a year is trying to just thrust young guys down everybody's throat without the benefit of working them in storylines and, and, and putting them in the limelight with guys who have, you know, something to offer. In other words, you know, let me give you an example. Diamond Dallas Page. Now, okay, everybody knows he's a friend of mine. I'm probably using him as a, as an example, you know, because of that. But that's not the case. Diamond Dallas Page was a guy who had, he he tried everything in the world to get himself over. And none of it worked. I tried to do things to get him over, and really none of it worked. the The only thing that really started to get him over at a point where he started, you know, to, to break into that, you know, top third, if you will, was when we worked him into an angle with Randy Savage. Because Randy was a name that everybody recognized, and it was a story that drew everybody's attention, and it was interesting to watch. Diamond Dallas Page benefited from Randy's brand name, and that's why I believe in brand names. You can't build young talent without them. And at the same, at the same time, I think um, you know, when when Hulk Hogan and Billy Kidman worked that thing, I think they both ended up coming out coming out coming out the worst for 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 it when it was over. Well, you're right, Dave, and, and you have to be smart enough to use judgment because sometimes either because the story dictates it or or because it, you know the, the chemistry just isn't there instead of a of a Diamond Dallas Page elevating to a certain degree to to Randy Savage's level in terms of perception because that's what this is all about instead of Billy Kidman going up a notch Hulk Hogan came down a notch and that's not a knock on Billy that was more probably a knock on the storyline and the planning and, and, and their creativity that went into the process. It was a bad matchup, I think, because the size difference and then Billy Kidman was playing the heel. And it, it, you know, like, so, so it's really hard for Billy Kidman to get a lot of heat so people would have sympathy for Hulk Hogan you know, with, when they had that big size difference and also that big disparity in star power. I mean, nobody believed Billy Kidman was ever going to beat Hulk Hogan. And you I mean, even when he did, and even when he did, nobody believed the it. The audience has to believe it could be true. It could happen. It could be possible. It doesn't mean that it is true, and it is possible, but at least could be. There's got to be a reality factor here. And you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the characters were cast in the wrong roles, 
you know, and in retrospect, that's pretty obvious. But at the core of it, even even beyond you know being cast in the wrong roles, it just wasn't believable. Nobody is going to believe you know a guy, and this is not a knock on Billy because I love Billy Kid. I think he's a great guy, and I like working with him. But nobody's going to believe that a five foot seven or five foot eight or five foot nine inch guy that weighs 165, 175 pounds is going to be able to kick the hell out of a guy that's six foot six or six foot seven or however tall Hulk is and 260 pounds. I don't care if he is 45 years old. It's not going to happen. Now you were talking about a little bit earlier. You said um, you know the problem with um, guys not wanting to put each other over. That wouldn't be as big a problem when you know everyone is being successful and uh, that sort of thing. But like right now, when things are not successful. How are you going to approach this if, for example, you have a brand name like, say, Kevin Nash, and you go up to him and say, look, we need you to put over this Chuck Palumbo kid, and we need to give him the rub, and, um, you know, this person says, no, I'm not willing to do that right now. I'm going to be careful how I answer that, <laughs> but I'm not worried about that, and, 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 I, and I'm, when I say that, it's because I think it's pretty obvious to everyone in WCW right now, that if they were as important as sometimes they think they are, we wouldn't have gotten a 2.2 last week. I think everybody recognizes in that company that in order for any individual to be strong, the company has to be strong. And in order for the company the to be right strong... Now, I'm sorry? <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, it's, okay. Go ahead, go ahead, Eric. And in order for the company to be strong, there has to be... Give, I mean, we have to build each other. There's no one person in that company right now that can carry that company. Everybody is going to have to tell stories for everybody else. Everybody is going to have to do what's required of them in order for the company to get healthy. And I'm, I, I honestly, you know, and I, you know, you know, I'll say it, knowing Kevin Nash is probably going to hear about this second and third hand and take it out of context. I, I'm not worried about Kevin Nash, quite frankly. I'm not worried about Kevin Nash saying I'm not going to do that. You know, both from the point of view that. You know what? If he feels that way, then I guess he probably doesn't fit into the big picture anyway. And if he walks out right now, it probably doesn't matter because how much lower are we going to go? You know. And that, uh, anything that's else, Rob? Uh, yeah, I have one last question after he's done talking. Go ahead. Okay. The uh, last question that I want to ask specifically about the booking of the company mm -hmm. and how the bookers now may have lost touch with the new audience. Right. And that a staff of Hollywood TV writers aren't going to be able to keep the pure wrestling audience and maybe the best course of action would be to bring in someone completely new with fresh ideas who maybe haven't worked in wrestling before and wants to innovate some new fresh ideas. Well, you know, I think it's a combination of the two. I mean, I think we have to have, you know, a wrestling foundation. You have to be able to kind of anticipate how, a, how the wrestling audience is going to react, you know, to certain things. You can't just go completely, you know, off the wall. Wouldn't a fan know best about that? I'm sorry? Wouldn't a fan know best about that, how the audience would react, do you think? Some fans. Some fans would. But, yeah. you know, what, what you're really talking is about research. And one of the interesting things about fans is they all have different opinions. Yeah, you know, true. they don't all think exactly alike. And, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I guess you could bring a wrestling fan in and listen to storylines. And, and there are some people that, that I know are wrestling fans and not really in the wrestling business whose opinions, are, you know, I, I, I value and I try to listen to, you know, from time to time. But, um at the end of the day, this is a television company. It's a television product. And, you know, writers, at least, whether they're from Hollywood or whether they come out of the world of wrestling, at least understand the product and understand how to tell a storyline and understand how to build a, an arc. And, uh, you know, it, it's a combination of people that understand the wrestling audience, you know, wrestling fans, if you will, and, and people that really know how to write entertainment. Well, I think right now... We're, we're, I think right oh, now, go ahead, Rob. We're really late on a break, so make it real quick. A second. Okay, I think right now the best combination, though, is going to be someone who is young, who has been a wrestling fan for a large portion of their life, has a lot of love for the business, and understands the way wrestling TV works now. And I would like for you to check out my booking ideas I have up on the Wrestling Observer website when you get a chance. You got it out there. All right. I'll okay. take a look at it. Okay. 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 Thanks a bunch, Rob. I want to ask this one last question, and... and it has to do with the, the TV taping schedule. A couple of months back, Brad Siegel made the call to eliminate the Tuesday shows and uh, tape only on Monday, Nitro, and then Thunder. And, and it, was, it was a controversial decision. I thought, based on what the company wanted to do, which was save money, that it was the right call. But since then, that Thunder show, even when the matches are good, it is, it's, it's such a depressing show to watch because, you know, you've got this small crowd, and they're not into it. 
and it just, it, it just, I think it's really hurt the company when you throw that show out there every week. And yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And when I heard that, I called Brad and tried to talk about him making that decision. We, we've gone through that experience before when we used to tape, um, you know, the WCW Saturday Night Show. This is obviously prior to Nitro, in front of a live audience. You know, at center stage in Atlanta. You know, the audience is is everything. And if you take the audience out of the show, I, you know, I don't care if you put, you know, The Rock and Goldberg, you know, in a match. If you do that in front of 60 people that don't know who The Rock is, that don't know who, you know, Goldberg is, it really doesn't translate very well. And there's no way you can ask an audience to sit in front of, you know, sit in an arena for four and a half hours and be enthusiastic about the product and care anymore. And, yeah, it saves money in the short term, but in the long run, it kills your product and it kills your brand. And I, I agree with you 100%. I've got to ask one question, too. Okay. How much wrestling have you watched in your uh, time off? Not a lot. Not a lot? Not a lot. I, you know, I, I drop into to WWF, you know, because I, you know, quite frankly, I find it entertaining. I drop into WCW, quite frankly, because I'm concerned about some of the people that, you know, I, I'm close to that are still there, and, and I'm curious as to, you know, what they're doing. But I, you know, I haven't sat down and studied, you know, both shows, and I, you know, I, I maybe watch on a Monday night. I probably spend about a half hour, maybe forty minutes, you know, between, you know, both shows. Mm-hmm. Let's go to Hector in Texas. Hector, what's going on? Yes. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate you on your jo- new job and wish you good luck. And I have a question regarding about um, WCW's image. In the past few years, um, the image of WCW has been very negative, and I wanted to know if a name change will be good for the company, and uh, or a discipline code, like people like Steiner and Madden get the same treatment. For the same thing, they're not supposed to. Yeah, um, you know, we've talked about, you know, the name change, and a lot of people have suggested that. But, you know, I think really if you turn the product around, if you make it interesting, you make it exciting, you know, let me put it to you this way, and I'll try to keep this short. We're two good ideas away from being pretty interesting and pretty competitive again, two big ideas. Uh, I don't think changing the name is necessarily the best idea. I think changing the product is a, is a better idea. And in terms of discipline, you know, I agree with what you're saying, but without going into any detail, you know, one of the reasons, you know, the reason Mark Madden left was probably somewhat different than what you've read about on the Internet and what Mark Madden has to say. Um, and my last thing is, well, what about Flair? What, I'm, I don't know how to answer that. What, what, what's your question? Oh, is there any plans for him? In- Absolutely. You know, I talked to Rick Flair yesterday at length, and, you know, Rick Flair is one of those people who, I mean, he is, you know, in many ways, you know, he is wrestling in many ways. And when you have a character that strong, that well-known, you've got to be able to be smart enough to find a way to use him that's very positive for both Rick Flair as a character and the business. And, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with our ability to do that. All right. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. Okay. Let's go to Tony. Tony, what's up? Hey, guys. How you doing? Good. Good. All right. Listen, uh, Eric, first question. Um, you know, when you first started Nitro, uh, it was a brash move that definitely paid off uh, going head-to-head on Monday nights. But now, you know, things have changed so much in a, in a four- or five-year period. Do you ever give any consideration to now possibly, you know, putting the two shows together and doing one, just one big super show a week on possibly a night when there is no other wrestling? Well, no, um, no, for two reasons. No, I don't believe in going to an alternative night because I think the one of the things that I think that that I'm one of the things I am definitely most proud of is the, is the fact that I think I'm somewhat responsible. And when I say I, I mean we, you know, at WCW are really responsible for growing the category. When we launched Nitro, we went head to head with Raw. Everybody said, you're so far behind, you know, they're the incumbent, they've been there forever, you're never going to succeed, you don't know how to do this, there's no way it's ever going to work. And it worked. And it, and it worked not only for WCW's benefit, but it worked for wrestling's benefit because the competition between the two companies and the fact that we were head-to-head actually grew the interest and grew the category. And I think by throwing in the towel and moving to a night when there is no wrestling would be, would be the, the dumbest thing that we could do. You know, my goal would be to go head to head, really, instead of starting at eight o'clock, start at nine o'clock, and be be more direct competition. And, and I think that is what's going to grow not only WCW's ratings, but but grow the category again. You think going head to head will grow the overall ratings of the industry? 
viewers in the industry, huh? It has. I mean, history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it, it has. absolutely did the first time, yeah. Yeah, but it was it was somewhat short lived, though. No, it no, it isn't. I mean, even today, even even in in w, WCW's depressed kind of environment, right now there are uh, what uh, seven seven and a half, sometimes eight rating points a week out there right. in professional wrestling, whereas before we went head to head, there was only three. So I, I, I can't disagree more strongly. I, I think that you know the wrestling, you know, category is stronger today by virtue of the fact that we went head to head. Someone asked me one time, you know, WCW, WWF, you know, the, you know, talking about the business and you know, is it real? Is it fake? You know, which you know, I'm so tired of answering that question. The only the only thing real to the wrestling audience is the competition between the two companies. That's real. And that's interesting, and that's exciting, and that will grow the category. To throw in a towel and just try to find another night, I think, would be bad for the wrestling business. I got a question on the ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, besides the Fusion, who I guess is the um, majority owner, and I guess TBS has uh, maintained a minority interest, are there any other uh, like well-known companies that we might uh, have heard of that have bought in on a minority interest basis? Yes. And, you know, I'm not at liberty to discuss that now. I think, you know, we're going to have another press conference when the deal closes uh, within the next 30 or 60 days. Uh, once everything is finalized, there will be another press conference. And at that time, you know, those names will be revealed. And, you, you, yeah, there's going to be some, you know. Moves. And my final comment, I'd like to give my uh, booking idea. Oh, I knew you would. I've got to give you the dream team announcing team you should go with. All right, who's that? Well, I think everybody's waiting for you to bring back uh, Mongo. Oh, no, David no. Crockett. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys, later on. Okay, let's go to, uh, let's let's go to uh, Chris. Chris, what's up? Hi, how's it going? Um, I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Bishop if he's going to go with active wrestlers as bookers anymore because in the past it's really killed um, a lot of the, the product in WCW, especially when Kevin Nash was booking, and I think, it, uh, I think it's a bad idea all around, and I just hope it's not something that they go back to doing. Oh, go, 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 go. Okay. Eric, are you still there? Oh, Eric's not there. Oh, my God. Okay, Chris, is, is anyone there? Brian? I have to talk on my own here. Okay. It's been an interesting show. We're, we're going to get Eric Bischoff back, right? We only have a few minutes left. Um, I just hope, uh, I hope this thing, I hope this thing goes, because uh, wrestling, you know, one thing uh, that, that he just talked about, um, as far as, I think that the optimum period of wrestling was a couple. Okay, it was a couple of years back when, when everybody was fighting over every quarter hour, and there was a lot of hot shotting going on. But it did make Monday Night Viewing very exciting, and it, and Monday Night Viewing has lost a lot of its excitement when it got one sided. So anyway, anyway Eric, you're yeah, back. back with you. To answer okay. the question, uh, no, I have no intention of bringing you know wrestlers in as bookers, you know, for the reason that that you brought up. It it, it just well, it doesn't work. You know, there's. Perception becomes a problem. Um, egos become a problem. It just doesn't work. Uh, so that you know, that's not the, not going to be the case. Okay. Is that, is is David there? Chris. Oh, Chris. Okay, Chris. Go ahead. Hi. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Okay. Sorry. Um, and I was also curious about the the rumors about him taking the show to like one location every week in in Vegas or somewhere. And I've even heard Orlando. I don't know if there's any truth to the rumors, but that you were going to do the show or like Nitro in particular, I guess every week from one location and where it would almost become, as far as the audience goes, a tourist attraction in that area. Um, is there, are there any truth to that rumor? We have discussed it. I mean, there's, there's a laundry list of about, you know, a thousand different ideas and approaches that, you know, a number of people want to take to this, and everybody has a suggestion. And it's certainly one of the things that we have discussed, and we've discussed it seriously, but no commitment, you know, has been made in that regard. Do you think that's going to hurt in the long run? Well, I mean, I'm sure it'll help financially as far as for the travel from going from arena to arena, but, um, like I said, after a while, it's going to be more of a tourist attraction, and there's only you're going to start to get um, fans that really aren't familiar with the product and I'm familiar with certain guys of the names like Hulk Hogan and, you know, maybe a Bill Goldberg or certain names like that, but mainly even the older names like Hogan and, and people from the past that they're going to come and expect to see. And in the long run, it's going to hurt because, you know, you know that you have to develop new talent. If you have those guys in position that in the past, and according to every wrestler that's been in WCW, have been squashing the talent that's come up, the guys that came up, and as soon as there was the, the slightest inclination that they were getting over, the guys on top, again, the name names like Kevin Nash and so forth, 
would do whatever they could in their own political way to to, to stop the squash and Hulk Hogan included. And I know he's a friend of yours, but this is you know what all the consensus consensus has been from everybody. Well, and, uh, let, let me know, okay, okay now, now you're a politician, and, <laughs> and, and I understand your position, and, and I and I appreciate your opinion, but. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that, but to, to answer what I think your question was in the beginning, certainly if we're going to go to a fixed location, your your point is very well taken, and it's a very it's a very good point. The only way that something like that would work is if there was a way to attract a fresh audience that was a wrestling audience. In my mind, that's the only way that that decision would work, and that's why no commitment has been made in that regard. It is a good idea from a financial point of view. It may, may be a good idea for a lot of other reasons, but it may be a bad idea if you can't find a way to bring in a wrestling audience because the audience is the show. Okay. And uh, like I said, as far as um, the, the, the creation of new stars, are you? I mean, you said you're not worried about guys like Kevin Nash. Because there's nobody in that company right now that is more important than a company that you know can can throw the company on their back and then take you guys. Pet, you know, especially with last week, I think the, the last quarter hours did like a one five with some of the bigger names and the supposed bigger names in the company, and including the world champion. And and that was going up against the match that the Rock had with referees involved, and and it was sort of like WF's co-main event that they put up against Nitro's main event. And um, if you're gonna have these guys. Like I mean, I, I guess I'm not gonna be able to do it to you because you know better. But they've been influencing the people there to 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 give them a perception that they're these big stars when in fact they're not any more important to the company right now than Sean Stasiak and Chuck Palumbo. Are. And I just hope that that doesn't continue because otherwise these young guys that are there, like a Lance Storm or somebody that has a lot of talent, aren't ever gonna get to break through like guys in the past, like Chris Benoit and everybody that jumped to the WWF. Chris Jericho, <clears throat> that we're never given the chance to just. Let, let, let's talk about Chris uh, Jericho. Okay. Let, let, let me. This is you know I don't want to get into a big debate, but let's talk about Chris Jericho. Do you think Chris, Chris Jericho is any better position on the WWF roster than he was when he was in WCW? I think from a at least a perception yeah. standpoint, I think he was given a chance in WCW. I'm not saying he wasn't necessarily given a, a total chance, but there were just I don't think he would have ever gotten to the point where he was going to break through and become. That next level star. I has think he, he has he broken through and become that next level star? In no, but I think he's at that point where I mean they've even they they put him in the programs with the top guys, Rock and Triple H. They did, and they took him out, and they right. put him back in the middle again. Is that the right way to to build a star? I don't I don't think it is, but I think being that they have so many, like you said, they're hot right now, and it's it's like they can sort of thrust. Chris Jericho is at that level where they can cut, sort of put him in any role they want him right now. Is that any different right than now? what we did with the, with Chris Jericho when we had him in WWE? He, he's, he's a hotter character merchandise-wise, though. I mean, like if well, he's really... a hotter character merchandise-wise because from a merchandising point of view, WWF you know, is just doing a much better job. But yeah. In terms I mean, of where he, he is in the roster and where he is in the storyline, quite frankly, other than the Chris, who's been you know worked in and out of that you know kind of semi semi main and main event position, you know, Chris, or excuse me, um, taking Chris out of it, uh, Jericho. Eddie, you know, and Dean are, in my opinion, eh, probably less significant to the WWF roster than they were to the WCW roster. Um, I think Jericho is is more, Benoit is more, uh, Malenko, maybe the same. Guerrero, I don't think Guerrero's any more. I mean, he's, he's, he's had more interview time. He's had a chance to be in a little higher profile programs, but at the same time, I think... Eddie Guerrero, because he's been injured a lot, he's lost a lot. He's had momentum. He's lost, he's been up and down with the momentum. Uh, one thing I want to ask before we before we run out of time is, um, any plans as far as cutting back the number of pay-per-views, or do you think that one a month is is going to you're going to stay with that schedule? And also, as far as what is the long-term future as far as touring on the road? Uh, your first question, no, we, we don't plan on scaling back, you know, pay-per-views. You know, we, we just want to make them better. We want to make them bigger. We want to make them stronger. That's the goal, not cutting them back. In terms of touring, the idea is going to be to, to build up enough interest in the product, to build the stars, to build the interest in, in WCW as a whole so that, you know, touring live becomes profitable again. You know, touring in the live event part of this business is a huge part of this business. Um, if we do cut back, it will only be in order to fix the product, put the wheels back on the car because they've fallen off. Uh, it's hard to put, it, it's hard to change the tire when the when the when the car is going down the road at 60 miles an hour. So you know, in terms of live events, yeah, we'll pull off the side of the road, get the wheels fixed, get the tires back on, and then head down the road again. But no, we're not going to cut back on pay per views. Okay, Dave in St. Louis. How you doing? Um, Real good. Uh, I ha I'm stuck here in St. Louis, uh, Missouri 
mean, I, I've been a wrestling fan all my and life. By the way, I'm really sorry to hear that, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> in the middle of America. But, I, I mean, I've been a wrestling fan all my life. I'm 32 years old, yet, you know, I have lots of friends that are 18 and young and know what's hip and up. I have ideas in my head that I just know would sell merchandise, give you good ratings, and, uh, you know, make people like Prince I to the Rock. Today. And I'd like to know what, you know, I could possibly do to maybe help you, Eric. Well, uh, I can't give you my home phone number right now, but, uh, you know, maybe Dave has some suggestions, and maybe you can uh, post some things on, on uh, you know, WrestlingObserver.com. And, I'm you know, I, I check in with Dave's site, you know, on almost a daily basis. And, if the, you know, if he's got a way to, to post your input, I, I'm sure I'll pick it up. Because, uh, you know, you talked about acting co uh, coaches, to, you know, and creative people to come in and uh, maybe someone from the outside to, you know, give some great ideas for booking. And uh, I think you should go with that instead of a uh, kind of, uh, you know, relaxed approach and see what happens. And you should. Oh, hey, with... let, me, let me tell you right now, there will be no relaxed approach. I'm not, I'm not sure where you got that from. And, well, and I'm not taking the position of, well, let's just, you know, throw it up against the wall and see what happens. It's going to be very aggressive and there's going to be some radical changes. But well, you listen, if you've got ideas, post them on Dave's site. I'll pick them up. Ideas that make your head spin and your eyes roll in the back of your head. Okay, well then, then, then send them. Okay. All right. We are we'll we are like way past time, but I want to thank Eric for being here today, and hopefully we'll have him on, and uh, we'll have a better relationship with WCW, and WCW will improve because the industry needs, you know, an alternative product, and you know, it's nothing against any company. We want to see the brand grow, the entire brand grow. It's it was a lot more exciting, I think, wrestling two two years ago when it was a dog fight, three years ago. Um, and uh, anyway, we all hope for the best. I want to thank you, Eric, and of course, thanks, Brian. And we'll see everybody Tuesday at uh, 5.